baptisms. Baptism is one of baptism. Baptism is one of the most controversial subjects in the Bible. One extreme line of thinking claims that baptism is salvific, a false doctrine known as baptismal regeneration. Yet there is another extreme teaching that claims that baptism was instituted for only Old Testament Israel and the early predominantly Jewish church. This group claims that baptism ceased by the time Paul wrote his prison epistles from Rome and learned, quote-unquote, the revelation of the mystery. Another equally controversial area involves the question of how many different baptisms exist and which baptisms apply to the New Testament church. Some teach there is numerically only one baptism, Ephesians 4, 5, yet others recognize several baptisms, Hebrews 6, 2. Only one of these positions is right. Each group points to the Bible as their source for teaching, even those espousing heretical doctrines. The controversy exists because people do not rightly divide the scripture, and even those who do sometimes misinterpret what the Bible truly teaches. The first myth to dispel is that baptism always involves water. Unfortunately, far too many believers read the word baptism and automatically assume that water is involved in the baptism. For this reason, every reader must allow the scripture to speak for itself. For example, there are two baptisms mentioned in the following verse, and one of them obviously does not involve water. Acts 1.5 For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. The Bible clearly offers authority for teaching multiple baptisms since Hebrews refers to the doctrine of baptisms, plural. This verse alone demands that there must be different kinds of baptisms within Scripture. Determining what these baptisms are and how they differ from each other requires some diligent Bible study and an open mind to let the Scripture guide. The purpose of this chapter will be to study the various baptisms found in Scripture. Hebrews 6.2 Of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Some teaching differences involve minor disparities. Others involve quite serious deviations from truth. One area of agreement by all teachers should be that the Bible refers to more than one baptism. For instance, the Bible teaches that John baptized with water, yet what happened on the day of Pentecost with the Holy Ghost was another type of baptism. The Bible says that they were baptized with the Holy Ghost and not with water. These two distinctions alone should prove that multiple and diverse baptisms exist within Scripture. Water Baptism and the Baptism of Jesus Christ John's baptism taking place in the Jordan River offers a great starting point for understanding water baptism and also for understanding baptism in general. The Gospel books describe the scenario and circumstances of Jesus Christ coming to be baptized of John. The description of the baptism of Jesus is very simple and straightforward. John immersed Jesus Christ in water. Matthew 3.13 Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Definition. The word baptism simply means placing somebody or something entirely into some other medium. In fact, this definition flows throughout Scripture regardless of the type of baptism. The above passage clearly states that Jesus came up straightway out of the water. This is because baptism involves immersion. Sprinkling would not explain this statement. Neither would pouring water upon someone's head. Baptism involves placing somebody, in this case Jesus, into some other medium, in this case water. Three elements of baptism. This study started with the baptism of Christ to lay the foundation for baptism in general. This baptism demonstrates the most basic elements of all scriptural baptisms. Baptism consists of three main components or elements. Here they are. The administrator. He is the one performing the baptizing or administering the baptism. The subject. 
He is the person being baptized. The medium, it is whom or what the subject is being baptized into. Note, there exists no baptism unless there is a medium into which the administrator baptizes the subject. John's baptism of Jesus contained all three elements. John was the administrator, Jesus was the subject, and the water was the medium. This pattern is found in every baptism mentioned in the Bible. Regardless of the baptism, there is always an administrator who baptizes the subject into the medium. Generally speaking, ministers of the gospel are to baptize believers in water today in the same fashion that John baptized Jesus. The preacher, as the administrator, takes the believer who has come to be baptized, the subject, and puts him or her into the water, the medium. Thus, in a scriptural baptism today, we see the administrator, the subject, and the medium. Every form of baptism consists of this pattern. An administrator puts the subject into the medium. Consider a different administrator and the implications of this unique baptism. Baptism with the Holy Ghost. Right before Christ's ascension into heaven, Acts 1.9, Jesus said that John had baptized with water, but the Jews would be soon baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Acts 1.5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. John's baptism consisted of three easily identifiable elements, yet the Holy Ghost baptism makes no mention of water. The element that took the place of the waters identified as the Holy Ghost. The replacement is clear and easily identifiable. The Bible says that John baptized with water, but they were going to be baptized not many days hence with the Holy Ghost. The Bible uses the preposition with in both instances. Thus, the Holy Ghost or the Spirit of God serves the medium in the baptism with the Holy Ghost. This means that the Jews were to be baptized with or in the Holy Ghost. The verse mentioned from the book of Acts did not identify the administrator in this baptism, but Matthew records John clearly pointing to the identity of the administrator. Bible students recognize that John was the forerunner of Jesus Christ, Matthew 3.3, 3, and John mentioned that the one who would follow him would be the administrator of this Holy Ghost baptism. Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me, that is Jesus Christ, is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he, that is Jesus Christ, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Clearly, the book of Matthew identifies the administrator of the baptism with the Holy Ghost as Jesus Christ. He is the one who cometh after John. He was identified as the one who would do the baptizing as the administrator. The only element remaining yet unidentified concerns whom he would be baptizing. According to the scripture and historical record, Christ baptized the Jewish believers present in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. These were Jews who had already trusted in the Lord. Jesus took those believers and baptized them with or into the Holy Ghost. These Jewish believers were to be the subjects of this baptism. To more fully understand the baptism with the Holy Ghost, one must understand that this baptism was a particular event on a particular day. The context given in the book of Acts reveals the time frame of this event and says that the baptism with the Holy Ghost would occur not many days hence. It is obvious that the baptism occurred in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. It was a special holy day for the Jews and a unique day for the early believers present in Jerusalem. This day has never been repeated and Christians are never instructed to try and fabricate the setting. On that day, the believing Jews were baptized with the Holy Ghost. Other groups were later baptized with the Holy Ghost, but none ever mentioned the day of Pentecost. Just as the Holy Ghost was given to the Jews, Acts chapter 8 records that the Samaritans received the Holy Ghost. Yet after each group received this baptism, they never experienced the Holy Ghost baptism a second time. Acts 8.14 Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who... When they were come down, prayed for them, they might receive the Holy Ghost, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. After Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans were never mentioned as having received the Holy Ghost a second time. 
Moving along into Acts chapter 10, we read of the Gentiles being baptized with the Holy Ghost, Acts 10, 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. This is the only time we read of this experience for the Gentiles. However, there's one more illustration of a dozen disciples of John who had been following John's baptism but had not yet received the Holy Ghost. Acts 19.1 And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, That they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. The baptism with the Holy Ghost was an event that happened, and once it took place, the event was never repeated upon the recipients. Each of these events took place in the early church during the most transitional period in the life of the church. Today, without exception, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost takes place at the moment of salvation. This will be explored later in greater detail, but the timing of the baptism of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost is crucial. In Acts chapter 1, verse 5, Christ said that the baptism with the Holy Ghost would occur not many days hence, indicating that it was yet future at that time. Yet on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, Peter indicated that the prophesied event had already taken place earlier, pointing to the day of Pentecost. Acts 2.33, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. In summary, Jesus told the believers that the baptism was getting ready to come. Ten days later, Peter stated that the promise had been fulfilled. In between the promise and the fulfillment of the promise was the day of Pentecost. This particular baptism was a prophesied event that took place one time in Jerusalem on that special feast day and has never been repeated on that feast day again. Peter announced the shedding forth of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, and those who do not rightly divide the scripture attempt to apply that announcement to the church today. This has caused confusion and heightened the division amongst believers. Today, every believer has the indwelling Christ, or they are simply not saved. Romans 8, 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. According to the Scripture, the Spirit of God indwells believers, and believers are in the Spirit. That sounds like what happened to the Jews in Acts chapter 2. The believer today is in the Spirit, just as the Jews were baptized in the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Ghost is the medium into which every believer is placed in the Spirit. John the Baptist's message was clear. I put you in water, but Jesus is going to put you in the Holy Ghost. These early Jews were put in the Spirit, but we too are in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. The believers being in the Spirit is directly associated to the Spirit being in the believers. The two take place simultaneously. At the time the Spirit of God comes into a person, that person is put in the Spirit. All true believers are in the Spirit. We are all brought into the baptism with the Holy Ghost. However, it is done on an individual basis at salvation, not collectively like the event that took place on that first recorded day of Pentecost in the book of Acts. Since the early 1900s, charismatics have tried to imitate that singular event in history. Footnote number one. In 1906, the so-called Asuzu Street Revival in Los Angeles saw the birth of the Pentecostal movement. The preachers believed in a third work of grace following salvation and sanctification as the first two. They believed that the Holy Spirit was received during this work of grace and was evidenced by the speaking in tongues. They would pray to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in fire. The meetings were eventually moved to 312 Azuzu Street in downtown Los Angeles. 
Today, there are over one half billion charismatics worldwide, with most of them convinced that God ordained this confusion. Yet no believer needs to look for his own Pentecost, hoping to receive the indwelling of the Spirit or some type of supernatural manifestation. After all, the Spirit's indwelling takes place the moment a person accepts Christ by trusting in Him. The last phrase of Romans 8 9 draws the lines of demarcation. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. All believers are indwelt by the Spirit, and those who are not indwelt are not saved. Plain and simple, no Spirit, no salvation. All the saved experience the mutual indwelling of the Spirit. Although we do not have a so-called day of Pentecost, we have received the benefits minus the temporary sign gifts. All Christians are placed into that same program, although the details have changed. One baptism. Because people tend to force their private interpretations into Bible study, they make baptism one of the most controversial, misunderstood subjects in the Bible. Some teach that baptism was eliminated completely since the early church period. Yet others use the Bible to teach that there exists only one baptism because of the statement about one baptism in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4.4, 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Interestingly, people with varying theological perspectives tend to emphasize different aspects of this passage. One group points to the mention of one body, while another proclaims the one baptism. Interestingly, this same passage is used by these various groups to prove doctrines at opposite ends of the theological spectrum. However, both groups miss God's point and misinterpret the word one. Paul is not using one in this passage as a number and quantity, but instead utilizing the term to signify unity. In fact, one of the primary definitions of one means to be unified, forming a whole, united and undivided. Interestingly, the word unity is found only three times in the Bible, with the first time in Psalm 133, 1, and the other two coming in Ephesians chapter 4 within the context of the subject passage. Ephesians 4, 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Ephesians 4, 13, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The unity of the faith in this verse is the one faith of verse 5. This reference to one faith does not mean that there are not several expressions of faith. For instance, there exists the faith by which a person gets saved, and there is the faith by which a person walks as a believer. Yet God says it is all one faith. The use of one in this context means all the various expressions are united and undivided. They are one. If the one faith, in fact, limits faith numerically to one faith in existence, these expressions become self-contradictory because they are not referencing the same numerically one faith. Galatians 1.23 But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. Romans 3.22, even the righteous of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. 1 Thessalonians 3.10, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Every astute Bible student recognized the need to acknowledge and grasp the varying face. Interestingly, the book of Judges offers one of the most poignant examples of how one can refer to unity. The book of Judges displays how hundreds of thousands can be considered knit together in unity as one man. Judges 20 verse 11, So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, knit together as one man. Colossians then connects the theological dots by addressing how believers' hearts should be knit together in love. Colossians 2.2, 2, that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and unto all riches and the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. With hearts knit, the body is knit together for a single purpose. The purpose of this unity is so the body can increase with the increase of God. Those knit together are considered one. Colossians 2.19, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Spirit Baptism 
Doctrinal error rears its ugly head when people confuse one type of baptism with the other various baptisms. We have considered water baptism and the baptism with the Holy Ghost. One especially troublesome problem takes place when people liken the baptism with the Holy Ghost to what the Bible terms as spirit baptism. The Bible refers to several different baptisms. Yet some Bible teachers incorrectly label some Bible doctrines as baptisms when they're not actually a baptism at all. For instance, some men refer to several separate things as spirit baptisms when at least one of these is not even an actual baptism. It is important to compare the various baptisms together. First, there's water baptism. This is the water baptism in existence today and practiced by those who understand its biblical significance. The person is immersed in the water and then ascends up from under the water. The following table illustrates water baptism with its three elements. The administrator is the preacher or one baptizing. The subject is the believer and the medium is water. The second baptism under consideration is the baptism of or with the Holy Ghost. Some people incorrectly refer to this as spirit baptism and this improper usage of terminology has created much confusion. Those who wrongfully refer to the baptism with or of the Holy Ghost as spirit baptism generally teach that the baptism takes place repeatedly in the believer's life. They also teach that believers should be trying to recreate or repeat their own Pentecost, whatever that may entail. Some believe this baptism to be an empowering of the Spirit, while others also teach that it is evidenced by believers speaking in tongues. Many look upon it as a second blessing or even a third work of grace. The proponents of this so-called second blessing use typology and scriptural analogies to support their doctrine, but there is no direct teaching in the Bible that tells us to look for or to expect any such experience. The chart shows the addition of baptism with the Holy Ghost. The administrator is Jesus Christ, the subject are the believers at Pentecost, and the medium is the Holy Ghost. Some people believe they need and are promised another Pentecost. They think the Acts chapter 2 account can and must be replicated for them to experience the true power of the Spirit. They think it is important to speak in tongues and have the rushing of the mighty wind described in Acts. They also look at the word fire mentioned in Matthew and again in Acts and think this equates to the need for them to experience a baptism with fire. Yet nobody wants to experience the baptism with fire mentioned in the context. Consider for a moment the definition of baptism and immersion. Baptism with water means that the person is completely immersed in water. Baptism with the Holy Ghost means the individual is placed in the Holy Ghost. The same holds true for the baptism with fire. All those cast into hell experience a baptism with fire. Matthew 3.10 And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This passage from Matthew chapter 3 mentions fire three times, and each time it refers to the fire of judgment, the unquenchable fire. Unfortunately, most Christians do not read their Bible to find out the context of any truth taught. They just want to experience God. Part of the confusion comes because little is mentioned concerning the spirit baptism. Yet the Bible does make mention of it. Simply put, at the moment of salvation, the Spirit of God places the believer into Jesus Christ. When a soul trusts in Christ and is saved, he or she is said to be in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1 There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Clearly this doctrine is taught in Scripture, yet some disagree with it being called a baptism. Most everyone will agree that we are in Him. We also agree that we were placed in Christ at salvation. The key would be to determine what places a saved person in Him. With this in mind, it is most likely the Spirit of God that placed us in Christ. The elements are the administrator is the Spirit of God, the subject is the believer, and the medium is Jesus Christ in the Spirit baptism. Take note when comparing the baptism with the Holy Ghost and the Spirit baptism that the administrator and the medium are reversed. 
In the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Jesus Christ placed the believers, the believing Jews, into the Holy Ghost. In spirit baptism, the Spirit places the believer into Christ. One was an historical event. The other is the experience of every true believer in Christ that takes place at the time of salvation. How does a believer today enjoy the blessings of the Spirit that came on the day of Pentecost? It is through faith. Galatians 3.14 That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. In other words, we are brought into the blessings that took place with the Jews on Pentecost by faith. Christians do not need some sort of Pentecostal experience. The promise of the Spirit comes by faith at the moment of salvation, but there is yet another baptism that occurs at salvation. The New Testament teaches that we are placed in Christ, the body, by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. The body mentioned in the context, the body of Christ. Nobody baptized in water is placed into this body because a man is the administrator of that baptism, not the Spirit. The water does not baptize into one body, the body of Christ. The Spirit placed the new believer into the body of Christ, the time of salvation. Therefore, every true believer is in the body of Christ. Ephesians 5.29 For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, and of his flesh, and of his bones. The New Testament consistently and repeatedly teaches that the believer is in Christ. Paul often referred to the believer being in Christ or simply in him. How does anyone get to be in him? The Spirit baptizes believers into Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Those who liken the spirit baptism in Romans chapter 6 to water baptism make a mess of the truth. Additionally, those who deny or neglect the truth of the spirit baptism must teach that the baptistry waters place a person in Jesus Christ. This is simply wrong. Water baptism is an external, physical picture of what spiritually happened to the believer at salvation. The believer's obedience to a visible water baptism pictures the spirit baptism that took place at salvation. A difficult spiritual hurdle for most to cross concerns there being numerically more than one baptism because the Bible does make mention of one baptism. How could there be more than one baptism and yet be only one? This is because the two baptisms, when viewed from the right perspective, are still simply one baptism. One baptism is the inner reality occurring at salvation. The other baptism is the outward picture of what happened at salvation once the believer obediently submits to this ordinance. Yet when considered together, they are still one baptism. These two baptisms are united and undivided. The new believer got into Jesus Christ when he got saved not when he chose to follow the Lord's command concerning water baptism. In fact, it is a doctrinal heresy to teach that water baptism places a person into Christ since being in Christ is a matter of salvation. Water baptism serves the first step of obedience for the believer, and it is a wonderful picture of the Spirit placing believers into Christ. Interestingly, man would not know about Spirit baptism if God did not tell about it in His Word. Unlike water baptism, which is external and visible, the spirit baptism is a spiritual truth that takes place inside the believer. Yet the two baptisms do work in harmony to provide a unified understanding of our union with Christ through the spirit. What then is a spirit baptism? Spirit baptism is when the baptizer or administrator, who is the spirit, baptizes the subject, who is the believer, into the medium, which is Jesus Christ. When does this happen? It certainly does not take place at immersion into the baptismal waters because it has already taken place the moment someone trusts in Christ for salvation. The subject who has been baptized is said to have put on Christ. Galatians 3.27 For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. By one spirit we are all baptized into one body and that body is Jesus Christ. This is spirit baptism. 
Yet water baptism still serves as an external picture of one's union with Christ. Just as the Spirit placed the believer into Christ at the point of salvation, so the preacher takes someone and places him into the water in obedience to Christ as a picture of the individual's union with Christ. According to the symbolism found in Romans chapter 6, baptism is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Water baptism, also known as believer's baptism, identifies the believer with Christ and his sacrificial payment for sin. In this baptism, the new believer displays that he belongs to Christ. The baptism gives an outward testimony that he too is a Christian. Additionally, the baptism in a local church identifies the believer with a local group of believers. On the day of Pentecost, Jesus put all the believers present into the Holy Ghost. We are not to look for another Pentecost. We come into the promise of the Spirit by faith. When a person trusts the Lord, that allows the Lord to place the Spirit in the new believer and the believer into the Spirit. Romans 8, 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Additionally, at the moment of salvation, the Spirit places the believer into Jesus Christ. Both events are independent of each other and should not be called the Spirit baptism. One is the baptism with the Holy Ghost, the other is the Spirit baptism. Believers do not need to seek the experience of Pentecost because the benefits of the Spirit are received by simply getting saved. Christians get Christ and the indwelling Spirit, something far better. The believer gets in on the benefit without any outward manifestation. What a blessing this doctrine is. Christians are accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Jesus is the beloved of the Father, and Christians are accepted in him. God looks upon the believers being in Christ. This is the reason the believers said to be sitting in heavenly places. All believers are in Christ and seated together in heavenly places by God who raised us up together. Ephesians 2, 6, and hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Filling of the Spirit. There's another Bible doctrine that some incorrectly refer to as the Spirit baptism. In fact, the Bible never refers to this event as a baptism, but instead as a filling of the Spirit. In review, there are three things called Spirit baptism, but true Spirit baptism only applies to one of them. Number one, the experience on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. This event on this particular feast day is not for believers today, and the Bible never teaches us to seek it. In Scripture, it's called the baptism with the Holy Ghost, not the spirit baptism. Number two, true spirit baptism is when believers are placed into Christ by the Spirit at salvation. Number three, the filling of the Holy Ghost can happen several times in the life of a Christian, but God never refers to it as a baptism. The third one, the filling of the Spirit, is not experienced by all believers. Otherwise, there would be no reason for Paul to command believers to, quote-unquote, be filled with the Spirit, and yet he did. Ephesians 5.18, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Unfortunately, most Christians will likely never be filled with the Spirit, reinforcing the fact that it is not an automatic blessing experienced by all believers. To be filled, the believer must relinquish to God's Spirit the control of his life. The surrender to the Spirit is revealed in the context of the Ephesians passage. Unlike the baptisms addressed in this chapter, the filling of the Spirit is not necessarily a one-time event. It may occur many times in the Christian's lifelong walk. Here's one example of such. Acts 2, 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. The Spirit gave them utterance. The apostles were filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2, yet later the same apostles were again filled. Acts 4.31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. The same men were again filled with the Holy Ghost, yet the result of being filled differed from what took place two chapters earlier. This time the apostles did not speak in tongues, probably because there was no gathering of people from many nations who spoke different languages. There was no need for tongues, but there was a definite need for Holy Ghost-induced boldness to speak God's Word. For those looking for boldness, the answer is found in being filled with the Holy Ghost. Some truths can be best illustrated by considering simple truths. For instance, the Holy Ghost filling can be visualized by considering a house. 
Think of this filling as the house where you reside with enough rooms to sufficiently allow guests to stay with you. Could a guest reside inside your house without the guest filling the house? Sure. Could this same guest reside in the house and yet not have access to the entire house? Sure. For instance, you could instruct the visitor to limit his access to certain rooms and make other areas off limits to him. The analogy is very real and applies to the filling of the Spirit. Whether cold, hot, or lukewarm, every saved person has the indwelling of the Spirit. The Spirit of God only indwells believers, and all believers are indwelt. However, simply because the Spirit indwells a believer does not mean that the individual has offered free access to the whole of his inner being. Think of the parts of your heart as the analogy of the house with its many rooms. Each room contains a different part of your inner man, a different part of who you are. The indwelling of the Spirit without the filling of the Spirit is like bringing someone into your house and saying, this is your bedroom and you can use the living room, but stay out of the rest of the house. The other rooms are off limits. Unfortunately, this behavior is more the rule than the exception concerning our analogy. Most Christians relinquish only certain areas of their hearts or lives to God's Spirit. We may even offer Him our full attention on Sunday mornings. While God appreciates that, He wants all of you all of the time. God wants you filled with His Spirit, all your heart, all your life. Yet man has the freedom to choose his level of commitment. The problem is that you cannot be filled with the Spirit until you are emptied of self. There are people who say they want spirit baptism or the baptism of the Holy Ghost when they are simply talking about the desire for a feeling or experience. They are looking for a spiritual high, a mountaintop experience. They want to brag on their experience because it makes them feel spiritual. They want to affirm their spirituality with some outward show. They may be good people with good intentions, but they are seeking something not commanded to seek in Scripture. God calls our surrender to the Spirit the filling of the Holy Ghost. This is not the Spirit baptism. You open yourself up for God to take the full reins and surrender all the runes in your house to His control. The only way to understand the filling of the Spirit is through faith, and we are commanded to walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 For we walk by faith and not by sight. When a Christian surrenders his heart to the Spirit's filling, he must trust that God has filled him. Man is never told to look for a feeling or a confirmation. This is why it is called the filling of the Spirit and not the feeling of the Spirit. Every Spirit-filled Christian's experience differs from that of others. As such, preachers should not preach their experiences causing others to elevate experience over relationship. Sometimes God makes himself real beyond one's ability to express what has taken place. He frequently deals with a man's heart, leaving that person forever changed. The Bible proves that we are not to be looking for another Pentecost. There is no need for this event to be repeated. What took place shortly after the crucifixion was the only time in history on that feast day that those particular happenings occurred. The Bible depicts the exact scenario. Jesus said the baptism with the Holy Ghost was coming in a few days, Acts 1.5. For John truly baptized with water, and ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. After the Holy Ghost came, Peter said it had come, Acts 2.33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalt, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Looking for some so-called Pentecostal experience is a selfish desire for a personal experience that people use to make themselves look spiritually superior. Everyone that is saved has the indwelling spirit. In addition to that, all Christians have already been placed in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful blessing from God. Every Christian should desire to have every blessing offered to him by the Almighty. Be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. This is the end of chapter 29.